Good afternoon, class. We're going to jump into lesson six for our Helco Economics uh, asynchronous class. And it's going to actually, uh, if you look at it, it's going to be one, two, three, four, probably about lesson five or, or chapter five in, in Dewar's text, because we're going to talk today about the market for insurance. And then before we jump into the market for insurance, we're going to go back and do just a little quick review of, of what we've talked about, especially since um, the quiz that we had. So we've spent the last two, two sessions or two chapters talking about the demand for health and the demand for health care. And as you remember, in, in Dewar's um, explanation or doers, depending on how you want to pronounce her last name you've you know she talks about health she talks about medical care and and she likes to frame it as if from what i can tell and the the addition of of demand for health and the demand for medical care gets her to the demand for health care and if you remember again from your micro classes demand is basically the willingness to seek a good or service and more importantly the willingness and capability to pay for that good or service. And when we're talking about demand, if, if you remember, I think it was in the last uh, class, we talked about demand versus derived demand. And with derived demand, it's, it's, it's basically demand that is generated because of demand for a related type service. So, you go into your doctor's office because you think you have the flu. And while you're there, um, so so the, the demand that you're seeking that day is the demand to see your primary care doc. You may end up with pharmaceuticals or prescriptions, depending on how you what you want to phrase it. You may be sent out for a lab, you know, draw on some blood samples so you can run some lab work if you think it's pneumonia. You know, they may do a chest X-ray. Uh, so those are, are considered derived demand. They are demand generated um, because your physician thinks that these services will help your uh, treatment plan and especially make your, your uh, treatment plan more effective because it gives your physician additional information. And the one issue that you have with derived demand, and then we we talked about it or touched on it, is supplier induced demand, and that's you know typically the acronym SID, S I D, and that you typically see when there's some kind of a financial arrangement embedded within that physician's contract that you as a patient don't really know anything about, and. That kind of brings us to the next thing where we, we also talked about asymmetric information. You go into your doctor's office and your doctor starts asking you questions and you may or may not as a patient be forthcoming on the answers, especially if you've been injured at work. We see a lot of patients uh, that will, that when the doctor asks them, you know, did this injury occur to work? Say it's a shoulder, an arm, a knee, a back. And first thing they say is no, because patients are so concerned that, if it's an injury at work, is it going to be negatively viewed at work? Even though if you're injured at work, you're supposed to, first thing you're supposed to do is file a complaint or file a report with HR so they can get you on their workers' comp program because injuries at work are paid through a workers' comp program as opposed to your medical program or your medical benefit plan. And also the flip side of that asymmetric information, you've got the patient, you've got the provider. And the provider, in theory, should know more about um, the diagnosis that you have, should know more about the treatment plan, should have a better idea of what the efficacy of that treatment plan is. They've been to medical school. They, more you hope, they've done a residency, an internship. Uh, they've been credentialed not only by the state where they practice, but they've been credentialed by the health plan that you happen to uh, have a benefit plan with through your employer group, hopefully. And so you, you end up with this principal agent issue. And a lot of it goes back to asymmetric information and the issue with SID and just a lot of different factors are driving this potential 
supplier induced demand issue between the principal who is the patient and the agent who is your healthcare provider. Things that drive um, the the desire for health for you know health care with its whether it's health status, whether it's medical care, whether it's the overall arching health care, you have things like age. So as we all get older, we just, it's, you know, we just, as we talked about last time, or maybe it was time before last, talked about, you know, we're all born with a certain health status and it just depreciates over time. I mean, that's just, unfortunately, that's part of getting old. And so as you get older, you're going to just, it's a natural progression. You're going to seek more and more health care services on average. Education's got a lot to do with it. Your income level, you know, has a lot to do with it. Your your health status, and especially with a um, a younger population, technology, especially if they can get on their cell phone and do a Zoom meeting with their provider, they don't ever want to go to the doctor's office. They get on, they talk, they chat, they use their um, their applications on their iPad, their computer, their cell phone, and they that's where they seek their medical care, especially. The younger population doesn't, they don't seem too concerned about health status. It's, you know, your health status, you start worrying about it at middle age and, or maybe not middle age, but say, say in your late, you know, late, mid to late thirties, early forties seems to be when most people start on average being concerned about the health status. And as you maximize your health status, in theory, it reduces the demand, whether it's direct demand or derived demand for medical care and therefore the um, overall demand for health care services. And then we went back and, and talked a few minutes last time about need versus demand. And, and again, demand implies a willingness to seek a good or service and the ability or the desire to pay for that good or service. Whereas need is actually driven by you need something. Most individuals go to the doctor because they need an issue. They need some treatment plan for a diagnosis that they're not really sure what it is, but they think they'll be able to go to their, their health care provider. They'll be able to provide them an accurate diagnosis, lay out a treatment plan. And as long as the patient follows that treatment plan, then you should have a um, a at least a higher probability of having a an effective treatment plan. Now, one thing that then I've been in healthcare for thirty some years, and one thing providers constantly complain about is they they perform the diagnosis, they develop the treatment plan, and when they explain the treatment plan to the patient, especially if they provide some <clears throat> pharmaceuticals to go with it, patient goes home. And I'll use antibiotics as an example. Patient, the doctor gives you a 14 day supply, says, you know, take, you know, gives you 28 pills, say it's amoxicillin, 28 pills, said, here, go home, take two pills a day for 14 days. Patient goes home, they take two pills a day for five or six days, and, you know, hey, they start feeling better and they just stop. So they don't take the rest of the medication. And, and depending on the individual, depending on what the diagnosis is, sometimes it's all right to stop. But in a lot of cases, you're just in for a setback and it's going to generate another doctor visit and an update to that treatment plan. So need, need implies that the customer or the patient really understands what they need and what they want. And demand is generally what happens when they go to see their provider and, and to seek out something to, to alleviate the pain that they have. And there are instances where <clears throat> need outweighs demand or demand outweighs need. And again, it's going back to wealth and income and, and a multitude of factors. But those instances can, it, you know, can raise their ugly head and the market in trying to move toward equilibrium sometimes has a difficult time in, in um, equating the supply and demand for healthcare services. And as we've talked a multitude of times, it's the uncertainty in the healthcare market or the medical care market or the health status market that, that drives, you know, variations in diagnosis, variation in treatment plans, variations in effectiveness. 
And I think it was last time we talked about the price elasticity of demand for healthcare services negative. And why is it negative? Demand curve is downward sloping. If it's downward sloping, the law of demand states that as prices go higher, quantity demanded decreases. Prices go lower, quantity demanded increases. So as you slide along that downward sloping demand curve, it's just expected that if you didn't know anything else about the price elasticity of demand, you would just automatically make the assumption it's gonna be a negative number. Now, if you're talking about absolute numbers, then you're looking at um, if, the, if the price elasticity is one, it's considered unit elastic. If it's less than one, it's gonna be inelastic. And if it's greater than one, it's gonna be elastic. So just uh, kind of a refresher course that, that you you've may or may not have remembered for your micro class. And we'll probably use these concepts as we go on through some of the other chapters. And lastly, uh, one of the drivers of, of demand comes into play, it, it's the cost and the time value. So there is a cost for seeking medical care. That cost is what the patient has to pay out of pocket physically for the visit. Could be copay, could be coinsurance, could be a deductible where they have to pay everything up front till they meet that deductible. But sometimes patients forget, the, and I'll call them the hidden cost, um, because as I said earlier, it takes somewhere between two and a half to three hours for me to live where I live uh, north of Atlanta to get down to my doctor's office, see the doctor, figure out my treatment plan and get back home. And in that time, I'm paying for wear and tear on the car. I'm paying for gas. I have to pay for parking when I get to the doctor's office. And it's just a time kind of cost constraint that drives uh, the demand for, for medical care and for health care just in general. And I think you can understand that if you're an individual at a higher wage rate, so you're generating more income, sometimes it becomes a complicated decision as to whether you actually go to the doctor or whether you don't. Now let's jump into the insurance market. And a couple of things, when we talk about the insurance market, it's there for basically one reason, and you know, well, maybe a couple of reasons, but um, one of the main reasons that individuals are interested in the insurance market, and if you go back to Arrow's uh, article that was published, he, he was doing his research late 50s, early 60s, published in 63, maybe not a lot of insurance plans available at that time in 1963, but the insurance market, the main function of that insurance market is to mitigate financial risk. It's to transfer financial risk from a individual, consumer, patient, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call me, is to transfer financial risk from me to the insurance company for a fee. And again, it goes back to uncertainty because there's uncertainty with diagnosis code, treatment plan, efficacy of the treatment. And it's that uncertainty that consumers like myself want to make sure that we have insurance because insurance has gotten extremely, ex I mean, healthcare services have gotten extremely expensive over the years. And we want to make sure we have somebody that's willing to assume the financial risk of those healthcare goods and services for a fee. Because if, again, if you go back to your old micro classes, uncertainty is transformed or transferred into risk through what? Through information. So if you've got information, you can transform uncertainty into risk. And in theory, at least in your you know financial classes, they'll tell you that you can somewhat manage risk. And that's what health plans are doing. And People ask me constantly, you know, to why why do you have why do you worry about a health plan? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And again, trying to explain to them that it's a transfer of financial risk because humans in general are risk averse. Um, risk averse about most things. Now you can have individuals that are risk averse and have huge insurance policies, but yet go to Vegas and gamble, uh, play the lottery, 
Um, so those those types of individuals that um, participate in those types of activities, I have I always looked at it. It's it's more of a utility function than it is being risk averse and not risk averse. And the second thing to remember is go back to that financial coin that I've talked about on numerous occasions. One side of that coin is providers. The other side of that coin is health insurance. And if you have questions about health insurance and why there is a market for health insurance, just think about the financial coin and think about who, who actually um, is driven by which side of the financial coin. So Health plans are, are willing for a fee to provide um, insurance in case of, you know, health care or health adversity. Providers on the other side are willing to provide their services to the insurance companies. And even though providers don't like it, uh, they actually need the health insurance companies because the health insurance companies guarantee them a certain level of revenue. So, the health insurance company contracts with the provider and for each CPT code um, and or each bill that they submit, they are guaranteed X number of dollars from the insurance company. They have to, they have to, um, so they have to collect uh, co-pays, co-insurance, you know, deductibles from uh, patients, but there's a lot less risk associated with getting your money from a health insurance company than there is trying to track down a patient and uh, get your uh, revenue from the patient. So providers, whether they admit it or not, like the insurance companies because the insurance companies provide them a certain level of revenue stream or a certain level of uh, consistency within their revenue stream. And so what happens in this risk mitigation process, you're transferring or your employer group's transferring or Medicare or Medicaid is transferring risk to uh, health plans and health plans are taking and based on a large pool of individuals, they are, they've got a bunch of actuaries in the back room somewhere, uh, probably don't even let them turn the lights on. So, you know, they go into this back room, there's a bunch of actuaries sitting around a computer, you know, a bunch of computer terminals and they're just cranking away. They've got spreadsheets, they're running SAS programs and they're generating probabilities based on age sex sales. So uh, if you're a male and you're in a like less than, let's say between 18 and 35, the probability of you getting sick is pretty low. Uh, if you're female within a certain age range, say, you know, upper teens to, uh, let's just call it, you know, early 40s, and those are considered by actuarials as, you know, kind of the childbearing years when everybody, you know, trying to grow a family, then you may have a higher uh, premium for that individual. So the actuaries are all back there coming up with these numbers, probabilities, and age sex sales, and then they combine them all. And they have a premium that they will charge the employer group for individuals <clears throat> that work for that employer group. So that's that's the basis of the insurance companies. Health plans want to make profits. Individuals, employer groups want to transfer financial risk. And it makes a market that, uh, for the most part, it's, it's a fairly efficient market. Buyers and sellers are coming together. You know, I've got buyers and sellers between the providers and insurance companies coming together and negotiating rates. You've got buyers and sellers, insurance companies and employer groups coming together and negotiating rates. And, and it, is a, it is a pretty effective, pretty viable market. And the reason it's there, it's, it's because risk of disease and illness and, you know, treatment efficacy and costs associated with positive treatments. And more importantly, financial loss from... Um, negative type uh, health care treatments or bad treatments. And you've got individuals that most health plans have what they call a catastrophic cap. So, you know, it's, you know, the health plan will pay up to a certain number of dollars and it's going to vary from one benefit plan to the next, but they'll pay up to a certain amount. But employer groups and individuals can also purchase uh, what they call stop loss insurance. And if it gets to a certain amount, and the insurance company won't cover it any longer, then the stop loss insurance kicks in and helps to offset some of that financial risk. And risk aversion is, it's, it's basically a, a 
characteristic of, of your utility function. You, me, all individuals, whether they realize or not, again, are trying to maximize their utility function. And when you're talking about the utility function, you're looking at the marginal utility of offsetting an additional dollar of risk. So it's the marginal utility of a dollar increasing. It, it, that's kind of what drives lotteries. So it, it's a marginal utility of a, of, of a dollar increasing in those lotteries. And, you know, people, as those as lotteries get bigger, people start looking at the marginal utility. And, you know, that's getting bigger. And I'm going to play the lottery because they're looking at the, the, the probability. Well, they're not even looking at the probability. They're looking at the utility that they can achieve or they can maximize by winning the lottery. And if you look at the margin of utility on the healthcare side or the insurance side, they're talking about um, the margin of utility that they see or the satisfaction or the perceived benefit they see by having a health plan lay off this financial risk. And the probability of a loss, when you're talking about insurance or lottery increases with low probability, high dollar loss events. So you are really concerned uh, if you're going to be involved in a high dollar loss events, especially on the, the healthcare side. And we will try to get into it a little later, but there, there's, I call them basically two types of insurance. You've got, you've got health insurance and there's some variety of, you know, within health insurance. And then you've got what they call property and casualty. You'll hear uh, individuals talk about P and C and P and C are things like, homeowner's insurance, your automobile insurance, uh, life insurance, um, workers' comp kind of falls more uh, under, I think, more on the healthcare side, even though it's not paid out of your medical premium, it's, it falls more in that, on the healthcare side. And, and then finally, where I talked about initially, uh, humans are, are, for the most part, in general, I'll say, see, I'm talking like an economist now, for the most part, in general, on the other hand, you know, you, you, sometimes people wonder how many hands we have as an economist because we're always saying, well, on the other hand, um, but risk-loving individuals gamble, play the lottery, go to Vegas, um, go to the local bingo parlor, and they're all playing, they're all gambling. They like that thrill, that utility of winning. Um, and some people will even argue that there's a perverse utility function that applies to uh, the level or the magnitude in which you lose. So, and most people understand that gambling gets an unfair bet. And from my perspective, I've always looked at gambling as it's just entertainment. If, you know, when I go to Vegas, my wife worked in Vegas for a couple of years and I'd spent a lot of time out there back and forth with her. And um, we would, you know, occasionally go into the casino. And if you go into the casino, you'd say, okay, I'm going to play a hundred bucks. And you'll do some slot machines and you'll get it. You know, I always get at the low table, laid, laid low bet tables. And, and, you know, you just look at it as entertainment, just like going to the movies or going to a ball game. Um, it's where you start, trying to, to convince yourself that you're going to beat the house, that you're going to beat the probability and come out a, a winner, it's just probably not going to happen. Because if you think about it in Vegas, for every winner, there's a loser. Somebody's going to lose. Somebody's going to win. And you've got the house sitting up here or the casino up here sucking off their profit. So it's, it's just an unfair bet when it comes to gambling. And that's going to kind of wrap this piece up. The, when I come back, we're going to get into some of the insurance fundamentals and financials. Talk to everybody in a few minutes. Thank you.